Okay, I think we're ready. Um, I think we're ready to uh, get going. It's a uh, pleasure this week to introduce uh, Chris Wirtz. Chris received his BS, de BS degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in environmental science, biology, and science communications. And he stayed on there to uh, take a master's and a, a PhD in science communication in 2021. In grad school, uh, Chris's uh, research covered uh, communication systems and dynamics related to a broad range of topics from GMOs to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, after the PhD, Chris came to NCAR as a postdoc at MMM, working primarily in uh, risk communication team uh, of the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI and Weather Climate and Coastal Oceanography. Uh, during his time at NCAR, his research has focused on communication and the use of a uh, range of forecast information throughout the Weather Society interface. Uh, as of last week, Chris is a brand new uh, Project Scientist One in the Weather Risks and Decisions in Society, WRADS group in M cubed. And uh, I think we've got, Chris said, we, we've got all the, uh, the buzzwords here. And, <laughs> And we've attracted everything except free drinks, but uh, <laughs> apparently it's worked. <laughs> okay, it's uh, AI tornadoes and uh, social science examining, examining trustworthiness and communication at the Weather Society interface. Chris. All right, thank you. So like I said, I've packed in a lot of buzzwords here to try to like draw in the crowd and use communication theory to show like short, punchy, get everyone here. Um, but to start off with, I'm going to do a little bit of background on kind of how I got here and what I'm kind of interested in working on in the next couple of years. And so my research background is really broadly risk communication. I actually started in health. And so when I was an undergrad, um, the Ebola outbreak was happening, and I took a risk communication class, and I was really interested in it. You know, why are people freaking out about Ebola in the US when more people are dying from the flu? Why is it getting so much media coverage? And that kicked me off in this risk communication kick. And so I have papers, and this is what I'm going to just show is my publication background a little bit, of a paper on Ebola, and then Zika hit for my master's. So I did a content analysis of, it was really convenient, of social media posts, <laughs> in, which is terrible, but convenient, because science communication, you have a lot of stuff going on there. And so I did a, an analysis of social media in Spanish, Portuguese, and English around that. Also did some longitudinal work with a collaborator, similar to what Julie's done for hurricanes, but for risk perception around disease. And then when I went to my PhD, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, which again, also gave more fodder for things to like <laughs> dig into public perceptions around risk. And so I have a couple of papers on COVID from perceptions and kind of work that we did in Wisconsin around strategically communicating using kind of science to inform our practices through the media coverage in the US and China. And throughout the same time, I also had publications from GMOs. We were actually in an agricultural college. So it's like you know, life science communication, a lot of that founded to the land grant institution idea. So a lot of papers on GMOs. Um, and same thing too, we look at GMOs in relationship to nanotechnology, because I had a huge nanotechnology grant where I was coming from. And then just broadly started talking about genetic technologies a little bit more. Same things like fracking, because that was also controversial for a while, and I hit on that. Also, same thing with human genome editing, which was interesting. and I took a swing at that as well, as well as then synthetic biology and expert perceptions and looking at how scientists view their fields, as well as then gene drives, and um, at the end, AI. Sort of teasing to that, kind of giving a signal of where I was going. And so from these papers, that I, things I thought were really interesting, it was like the interdisciplinary work. That was what's really exciting to me. You know, so we did this in reviews paper, bringing psychology and communication together, which I now know is like interdisciplinary light, because we're all still pretty able to speak the same languages. But then also these other papers, like the Journal of Science Communication paper around COVID, we brought together practitioners, different types of researchers from a more kind of broad, diverse set of um, backgrounds to really dig into those problems. And then the paper I really liked from PNAS was fun because we took a, it was a New York Times journalist and a an, uh, geneticist working on um, essentially with the communication team, what can we all agree on? What is the consensus around how we should be communicating about gene drives? And so we wrote a paper in tandem, really interesting piece um, that I was like, I like this. How do we work together more? And so I have those three background things, but across a lot of that, it was a lot of what we call quantitative social science. So some of that is statistical. So you have here like doing regression analyses, structural equation modeling, and experimental designs, like digging into the kind of how we can use the survey data to really understand behavior and using these statistical patterns, but also computational stuff. So actually using machine learning, 
to look at content. So we have these large corpuses of millions of tweets or you know, hundreds and thousands of media articles. How do we understand that? So examples there from the COVID paper, looking at US coverage of COVID versus um, Chinese coverage. So those are kind of the areas I started digging into. And there's one study I really enjoyed at the end of grad school. I was like, I want to do more of this. And so it was a study where I went to Peru a couple of times and like right before COVID shut everything down. And we dug in with a team of engineers, climate scientists, risk communication people, people from the business school and people from public health. We're like, there's this really big problem where there's flooding every year that goes 15 feet up in these communities. There's a lot of uh, what you call like economically disadvantaged communities, like you can see here, where they have to either put their, their houses up on stilts so they're ready for 15 feet of flooding. And if it's 15 and 2 inches, they're kind of in trouble because that's where a lot of your livelihood will be impacted. Or the houses have to float, and so they can be more adapted. And so we worked, did some meetings, and really dug into understanding that problem in what we call like a convergent way, which I'll talk about in a second. But I really liked that this was also qualitative research. It was really interesting because there was this rich depth that you couldn't get from a survey. The survey is really powerful for the breadth, but it didn't get the right kind of meaningful detail. And actually, on one of my fieldwork campaigns, I was talking to someone at lunch who was like, you know, actually, there is a relocation village. You know, people have moved people away from the flooding before. And I was like, what? We've, I've been here twice now, and no one's ever mentioned that. I was like, yeah, I'll take you out there. And so I ended up designing the study around that. So things you would never have gotten if you just launched a survey to those people where you assume you know the problem. The second thing was this is my first soiree into the weather society interface. I was like, this is cool. Like, really seeing how these kind of hazards and spaces are impacting and coming together, and it feels like it really matters. And then again, it's convergent, right? So we had these a lot of different people coming together from different backgrounds. And really focus on this problem of flooding. So how do we address it? How are we going to tackle this? And starting to see that blending of those disciplines, which is really exciting. And so with that background, um, I kind of this is what I honed in on what I want to do next. Finishing up during COVID on too many COVID papers all at the same time, I lopped that off of health. and did not want to do that for a while. It's only so much you can talk about and live at the same time. But I really want to focus on these theoretical high impact research problems, which Q Julie Demuth sends an email via a conference listserv, and there's this cool new postdoc that's working on AI. It's interdisciplinary, it has all the right words, and it's really cool. And that's how I got here. <laughs> and so the really following that, like a kind of happenstance email situation. And so now what I'm covering is this space, right? So looking at developers, researchers, forecasters, core partners, and the public, and the interactions among these group in kind of the mediated environment. And I'm going to show some studies here, too. So I won't hit on what these are, but you'll get the idea of some AI projects, some National Weather Service core partner studies, and then the tornado study. But it, we'll pause and do a huge cheesy thank you to Julie Demuth, because this is not a space that I knew beforehand and has been very generous and patient and mentorship and very kind and not only just sharing the research space that you love, but also making me love it too, and in encouraging me to grow in it and make space for me, which I really appreciate. And there'll be two more thank yous to Julie as we go. So it's going to be a common theme. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll continue to embarrass you as you go. And so for the talk today, this is the space I'm going to work on. So a little bit more nuanced version of that chart I just showed. But you have here is we have researchers and developers and users. And I have them purposely, with Julie's help, on the same level playing field here of understanding how we're interacting and developing forecast information. So things like models, the data we're collecting, all that jazz. And understanding that perceptions and understandings from both groups are going to impact some of these processes, both how they're used and how they're developed. And the decisions that we're making around them are also going to be really important. And those are then going to lead to the outcomes that we like to think about being positive, right? So better weather prediction, good decisions, saving lives, those types of things. Um, and just to give an example, this is essentially our study system where I'm trying to work on and figure out. I don't have a lot of answers to some of these things. We have some answers, but not all of them. Um, but here's some of the questions we're starting to dig into. Like, is it key for us to understand trust and confidence in AI or a numerical weather prediction model? Those types of questions. Or is it maybe knowledge or comprehension we should be looking at? Are we thinking about how people are looking for new information or the information they're relying on? And then leading down to like the outcomes. Are we worried about behavior, the communication of this information? What happens downstream? So really starting to unpack these systems and understand them better. And so for today, I'm going to focus on the study. The first study I'm going to talk about is on trustworthy AI. And that really understands this space. So how are we perceiving and what are the concepts that are key for understanding forecast information? And it's going to, the example I'll show is AI, but the, the concepts will apply to other spaces. And the second one is looking at communication environment. So we have this forecast information. How is it used? How is it interpreted? And what is the messaging system that happens downstream? So I'll cover each of those parts, starting off with the reconceptualizing trustworthy AI. This is a collaboration with a lot of people in the room here, actually, and probably online, I assume. I can't see who's there, but I'm assuming. 
Mariana and Andrea watching. Um, but it comes out of the, the AI2ES Institute, which Rich had the favor of having to read off first, so I won't do it. But its idea of essentially is covering trustworthy AI at the kind of environmental science space. And you can see this has got a lot of people involved in it. So Julie co leads the risk communication, um, as well as then Mariana, myself, and Andrea are recent project scientist ones who are working on the same project. And then Jacob, who's a visitor in. MQ, but also like affiliate with some of those other organizations. I put you in different colors, so you're represented, but you know, kind of other stuff. Um, but you can see it also involves a lot of different institutions, right? So it, from Oklahoma all the way through to a bunch of different universities, private sector partners, public sector partners, and all that jazz, as well as you can see um, David John Gagne, who's here, you know, shout out, um, in the Miles group all over there. Um, so it brings in together M cubed, Sizzle, and Rao. So a big cross, you know, with a lot of organizations represented within NCAR and beyond. And so from the risk communication team, which is where I live, um, we're focusing on things under the direction of Julie, the factors that influence trust in AI, how AI trustworthiness is really influencing risk perceptions, and then how can this all lead to improved decision making. And so this might be new to some of you, but trustworthy AI has gained a lot of traction as a frame, both in policy documents. Um, so you can see things like, we need to work on these ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI at the international level. You know, it's something, it's a rhetoric we're starting to see. And same thing for, there's another international group here, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, also has standards and starting to put stipulations out for what it means to develop trustworthy artificial intelligence. And even from the US perspective, we have executive orders, right? So promoting the use of trustworthy artificial intelligence in the federal government. So it's a really strong frame. And it also comes up in a recent document too, from the US of this blueprint for what we call an AI bill of rights, right? So it's something we're seeing a lot more and more as a frame of trustworthy AI. But it also comes up from funders. So the AI Institute we have, they are engaging the concept of trustworthy AI, and they're handing out millions of dollars, right? So they're not handing out, that's a terrible thing. But they're, they're, <laughs> you can earn millions of dollars um, through their robust proposals to do these like large five-year institutes um, across the system. And so you're starting to see this really prominent frame and it's also something that, that people are starting to do research papers about and talking about trust with AI. We need to figure this out. What does it mean? But also then kind of half come arguing what it means in not so great ways. And so what it looks like a lot of the time is trustworthiness is conceptualized in very a theoretical way. So not engaging past literature is what I mean by that. And it's varying a lot. We're not seeing a lot of consistent definitions of what trustworthy AI is. And it also is something that seems to have a lot of varied um, Subdimension, so people being like, it's performance that's important, it's benevolent, so it does a good thing is what's important for trustworthiness, and that's also not consistent or backed by research. And the same thing too, it usually talks generically about model performance, but in pretty broad and vague ways. And then it's also just tends to be a synonym for appropriate use. Trustworthy means you use it the way I want you to use it, right? So some problems with that we'll unpack in a bit. But just sort of on the common ground, I'm gonna throw out some definitions of trust and trustworthiness. So you probably have your own working definitions of them, um, but I'm gonna put these ones we developed for our institute out just so we can be on the same page. And they're meant to be pretty broad and high level. There's a lot more definitions you could pull on, and I've fought with these definitions on many people with <laughs> in and out of the teams. Um, but just the idea that trust is in the presence of uncertainty, so when it's not for sure, there's a degree to which someone does or does not rely on or put faith in someone or something. That's what we're talking about for a trust. And then trustworthiness then builds off that concept and is an assessment of whether, why, or to what degree someone or someone should or should not be trusted. Right? So those are the kind of ideas we're starting to pack and see a little more definition than even a lot of some of the AI definitions are put there. But we're gonna think about reconceptualizing it um, in the context of past literature because there's been a lot of work, you know, theoretically and empirically on trust from many different types of social science. And so first off, risk and trust, which is where a lot of, like Julie, myself, and Mariana's background comes from, it thinks about trust in the context of a risk, so a hazard or something bad, but it's generally thought about if do you trust a person or a type of person, like a scientist or an organization, to sort of like manage, mitigate, and deal with some of these risks. Do I trust my like city developers to protect me from flooding with their planning? Right, so I'm not trusting that it won't flood, I'm trusting the city planners is a key thing there from that literature. There's also a lot of work from interpersonal and organizational trust, a lot of the foundations are there. So what does it mean to trust someone else? You know, what does it mean to have an organization where people trust each other? And then trust and automation is a field that came up um, largely around things like, um, like your autopilot. You know, so do you trust that? When should you trust your autopilot system? When do you know it's failing? What is kind of the balance between human and machine? It's a whole focused literature. 
And then you have this new emerging body of literature reverence like trustworthy AI. This is what we're writing about. And we see some citations from this literature into the trustworthy AI literature and some from trust and automation, and none really from the risk literature. So that's really where we're working, trying to put it in there and make sure that we can gauge all the past findings from a really relevant body of literature and how we're talking about it now. And so we reviewed all of this literature to come up with, you know, what are the key points about trustworthiness that we need to make sure are still talked about in our discussions of trustworthy AI as we throw a lot of kind of time and effort into this space. And so why you do this is that essentially to address a lot of these theoretical inconsistencies and shortcomings of how we're talking about this, because the frame is kind of out of the gates, people are using it, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. And also to increase the utility, because a lot of these things are paired with a lot of effort and time. You know, so we're going to develop standards for this. We're going to put a lot of researchers together to make sure these are the right rules. But do we know if we're actually getting what we're measuring? And so then, in addition to the theory, I read a lot of papers part. I also used some data to make it real, right? So using National Weather Service forecaster interviews to concretize some of these ideas. And you can start to see how they come out to users and how users are understanding these concepts. And so just to context on that data, it's coming from work from AI2ES, where it's ongoing, so we're still collecting data. Um, and there are interviews with National Weather Service forecasters in the US about coastal fog prediction. And so we've done 10 so far, and that's where these quotes are going to come from. But there are also just um, US forecasters from different areas who face coastal fog challenges and have to predict those regularly. And it's part of a broader project um, where we're essentially demoing out a AI prototype for fog development and trying to understand perceptions of it, what, how are people reacting to it, what's important information. But we do have a section that I bolded there just right on the perceptions towards AI generally and the use in forecasting and then about trustworthiness in general. And so the big synthesis, there's two points, is that trustworthiness is perceptual. And I'll break down what this means in just a bit. But it's the idea that it's a result of a subjective evaluation. But it's also context dependent. Like these are things that are non-negotiable for trustworthiness. And if you don't address these points, it's not going to essentially capture what you're hoping it does. And so to say what I mean first by perceptual, this idea is it's not an objective characteristic is key. And so if you think about in this, this frame on the left, we have there's an AI model. I, whoever I may be as a developer, researcher, user, going to look at a model and be like, is this trustworthy for me or not? I'm going to make that decision for me. It's in the eye of the beholder. It should sound intuitive, but a lot of times you want to define it. The trustworthy score of this algorithm is seven, and it will always be seven, and it will, no matter who you're looking at, it will be seven, or 42, whatever you want it to be. And so the idea is like, and it will always work like that. And it's, that's just never going to happen, and it's never the way that the concept was designed or theorized or has ever been kind of backed up in the literature, right? And so if you look at some of these literature, and of course I pulled out here, this is actually one of the most famous definitions of trust, I think, in all of the fields. And it comes from interpersonal trust. Um, this, this paper does. And so I've highlighted from here a quote where they talk about perception and interpretation are really key for the evaluation of trustworthiness. And it's actually in this paper, too. They say, this probably won't generalize you know, to other contexts besides interpersonal trust. Yes, this is what everyone cites for trust in AI. right? So did, didn't read the full paper kind of situation. And it's, and it's limiting how we're talking about it. Um, and so we're pulling some of these details back out and making sure they get back into discussion. Same with the trust in automation literature. They highlight that same point. It's based on these perceived qualities and how we're interpreting them. That's where trust starts to come from. And if you don't believe the theorists, there's also data to support that. And so we have thinking some of a, a highlighting forecaster quote here. When we ask them, what does trustworthiness mean to you in the context of new guidance? And they said, well, it depends on the person. You know, and this person is like, I got a modeling background. So I'm interested in this new stuff, but someone who's been doing this a long time may take a longer time to, to really come around and trust a new product. So point out differences based on the experience that they have. right? So if I have a, a background and a technical knowledge for this, I may trust faster or maybe trust differently. But knowing someone who's coming at it from a non-modeling side, it may be a very different process. Same model, but acknowledging already that you know trust is going to be a process you develop on your own. And the second point here from a different forecaster is that you know, I would look at this kind of aspect of trusting AI or ML just as like any other type of guidance. It would pass through the same rigors of my own personal process, getting trust in it, just like any other guidance that I have. Right? So just acknowledge that this isn't a personal process. Deciding whether you trust something or not or how trustworthy it is is a part of an evaluation you do on your own. Right? Then also noting here is interesting is that not differentiating between AI and NWP type of thing. So second point. The trustworthiness really depends on context. So we have our model. It doesn't just live in a vacuum, and then we can do the trust score is 42. We have a development context and a use context that are going to matter here. And so what I mean by development context is there's different considerations. So from the, the developer side and development side, what are the techniques that were used? What was the data? What data were used, and how were they processed? How well does the model perform and verify? 
Is the model interpretable, explainable, and so on? The things that we might think about in our own work. And also from the user perspective, you know, what is the purpose or the goal of the model, right? So is it being made to do my job for me or to provide assistance for my job? Is it making a specific prediction or telling me where I should focus my attention while doing this task? Um, and will, again, will the model provide information or make decisions? A really big difference in your trust. And then what are the implications associated with the model and its use? We see this factor, again, in all the other literatures too, especially trust and automation literature, right? So understanding trust requires this consideration of context and many different types of context. You trust just doesn't exist in something we can define on our own, but it has to be built and have this context around it. And the same thing too, in the next quote, you see like the specific context of the interaction is really what drives a lot of these conceptualizations, conceptualizations of trust. And again, this is also something you see in the data from the forecasters, right? So, for Coastal Frog, they're saying anything will help because it's an extremely challenging um, hazard to forecast for. You know, it doesn't have to verify better than the other products. It just continues to sway us a little bit. Um, you give us a little bit more confidence, and that's huge. Like, the, that's the trustworthiness I'm looking for. Right? So you think about because Coastal Frog has this limited guidance ability, they're having different standards are going to evaluate trustworthiness a little bit differently. You know, so they might not say, they probably wouldn't say the same thing for severe weather products, right? So you have a more saturated market, and like performance standards may change. So even within a person acknowledging there are differences in how you're interpreting things. And the second quote here too is they, they value trust in it being tested and vetted in some way. So like the forecaster here wants researchers to look at this and test it out for hopefully at least a full entire season, look at the guidance in house and see even if it's verifying before putting it out there. Right, so trust came from vetting it from a team. Right, so it's like if I know people are going to look at this and they actually care enough to take take a year instead of just throw it to me, that's what I'm going to trust. I trust that that you put the effort in before you gave it to me before saturating the market a little bit. As so you pull these things all together, um, you have your model, you have your development context, people who are viewing it, making their own subjective evaluations of what trustworthiness is, and the key factors for the development side as well as the use side on each dimension. And noting that this will change probably, varying between different types of developers are going to have different perspectives and different users will have different perspectives. So you could think here, you know, if you're a researcher at NCAR, you have a visitor, they make up a cool model, it predicts like tropical cyclone rapid intensification. Awesome, this is super trustworthy for you to present at the end of the summer. But what if I asked you, would you put this in front of like decision makers or would you operationalize this right now? Like, ooh, I don't know, the trustworthiness of this changes maybe a little bit. Maybe the, maybe the student's perfect and you're like, yes, let's go for it. But maybe not, maybe you have to think I should know a little bit more about it. And the context would be really mattering. And if you're a forecaster looking at the same tool, you're like, is it something that's gonna tell me, hey, you got an alert, you should start watching, maybe it's gonna happen in the next couple days, or is it saying, I'm gonna auto predict it and send notifications out to people? You know, so those types of contexts are gonna change the trustworthiness within people and across people. Um, and so why does this matter? It's, it's not just an academic exercise that I don't like how people were using some words. Um, that is part of it, it's somewhat frustrating. But the idea is like the words we have have meaning to people, right? So you, you should trust this. I was like, why? You can't tell me what to trust, right? They, friction points on it. And we're using, we're telling people what is and is not trustworthy implicitly in some ways, right? We're creating standards for it. And the idea is that we should take these efforts and really try to Think about if we're trying to standardize trustworthiness, we have to consider the users and the researchers' perceptions, right? So thinking about perceived trustworthiness, how do we increase the perceptions of trustworthiness instead of being how do we define it to be trustworthy? And then again, focusing on these different contexts and perceptions instead of trying to define it on our own. Because in a lot of time, we're also baking a lot of our own perceptions and biases into it from the get-go. And the last part of this I think is really interesting is that it's also a convergent research project in a lot of ways. And so, this is defined as like, okay, we're working together to solve you know, this vexing problem or address a vexing problem. And you do so by coming together with this deep integration across disciplines. Those are the two ways, the two prominent points that NSF has. And we do this by uh, tackling a really common, a really popular term and concept, making sure you really understand it, connecting theory to practice and theory kind of to how we're framing our issues. Um, but also then thinking too about deep integration across disciplines is the author list here is pretty ranging, right? So people who are experts in meteorology and like risk and decision making, communication, um, AI, all mixes in between and putting this in a journal that's you know, beyond a lot of our own domains. But also you think about the way we engage and work together is also changing kind of how we're doing the science, right? So it's a new framework here for how we approach these issues, how we're thinking about it and how we're talking about them. Um, it's a really key thing there. And so before summarizing, taking an intermission break here, a lot of thank yous again, Julie, Mariana, Andrea, DJ, the, our NCAR AI2S folks for supporting the paper and the efforts. Forecasters for sharing the time. Also NCAR library was amazing because I needed a lot of papers and obscure papers I did not have in books and so they're really great about getting resources and then thanks to funding too. So intermission check-in, take a breath, 
Any burning questions I can take now too? But otherwise I'm gonna move on to part two. All right, cool, people look ready. And so we've talked about, <laughs> that didn't give a lot of time. Um, we've talked about the system of looking users and developers, type of systems and researchers. Now we're gonna focus on outcomes, right? So we have this weather information, this forecast information's been produced, what happens next? And so that's gonna be focusing on the communication environments, and this is where you get your tornadoes, if this is one of the buzzwords that really brought you here today, the rest is for you. And it focuses on the December 10th to 11th tornado. So on December 10th, 2021, there were several pretty dramatic and intense tornadoes. Um, and primarily the one I'm gonna focus on is a violent EF4 that went through, it was a very long track tornado, and 128 of those miles went through the Paducah County warning area, so an area that one forecast office is in charge of. Um, and it caused a lot of deaths and injuries. And so focusing on this, this study, um, we're working on understanding the communication environment for this space, right? So it's a big event and there's a lot of damage, but kind of what happened, what were the successes and failures here in some ways is what started us on actually through talking to another forecaster for a different project. But this builds on a lot of past social science research too in related spaces. A lot of um, the research of which comes from like the, the M cubed lab, which is exciting. But you can see we've hit on a lot of these concepts that I won't go through in, in depth, but you can see that people have hit on a lot of the concepts like complacency or confidence, information and seeking and like tornado myths to kind of understand similar phenomenon. What I'm gonna do is take, so the, build on this work, focus on a framework from actually a, a paper that Rebecca led. Focus on understanding the dynamic interconnected processes that characterize modern hazard information, which I really like that sentence. Like, so understand that this system for information is changing and evolving, and that's where our weather information is starting to go through. But also then pulling in some of my mass communication background. Right, so we have theories about media systems, like the environment and the, like the social factors in which like the, the message is being developed, shape the message type of idea, and also communication repertoires. No one uses one source of information. You use many and you have to weigh them and navigate it across those spaces. And so with that, focusing on two main research questions I'll talk about today. Right, so what are the factors that are important for understanding communication environments? So this space around, you know, we think about the physical environment a lot, like how is it coming together for you know, either being a very powerful storm or maybe the storm doesn't verify, those types of things. But we have that same thing on the social side. What are the factors that are really shaping how the communication played out, whether it be for a success or failure, leading up to and during the December 10th to 11th events? And then the second question is, how does this, this communication environment then relate to the physical environment? So the different types of events that we have are likely to be communicated or have different types of communication patterns depending on how they unfolded. And so to do this, I did 40 semi-structured interviews last spring, 11 of them at the forecast office in Paducah, six of them with emergency managers, four with broadcast meteorologists, and then 19 with the public. And it was along so that whole stretch, went to a bunch of different cities to talk to people, different levels of impact from people who had their homes destroyed to people who were like, you're just near misses. And so things we focused on there were communication information, the successes and challenges around communication, and then their stories and experiences. And so what I did is I brought these things together to develop what I'm gonna call just like the communication landscape for the communication environment. And we often think about guidance and observations, going to a forecast office, they develop these formal products, things like warnings, the weather radio, the discussions they put out are special, special weather statements. Um, and then they send these out to their core partners, right? So the broadcast meteorologists, emergency managers, and the public. And this is the whole communication landscape, right? Wrong. So we also have a lot of different ways that you can get information through here, right? So we have decision support services packets, so, right? So email briefings that are sent out with distilled information from the forecast, the forecast office to their core partners, which often in, in this case we learned got sent on to many city officials and other people, right? So the weather information really flowing out in those channels, but also briefings. You know, so people coming together every week, what's the weather gonna be like? Do I need to worry about anything? Or if it's, hey, it's looking really bad, you need to come here, like we'll have another conversation and give you the details as it goes. You know, a really strong way that communication happens. Then also NWS chat. So there's essentially Google Hangouts thing eventually will be, I think, a Slack, where people come together across all these different avenues. So emergency managers, broadcasters, forecasters are all in the same space, working, kind of being able to communicate together um, and share information back and forth. And then you also have calls and texts still being a really key part of this information landscape, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but that informal communication is still pretty, pretty strong and both in terms of you know, getting information out, but also getting information as a forecaster. Like, so getting those storm reports and kind of hearing what's happening in the ground can be pretty powerful. And then also social media, we know that, pretty powerful source these days, but also still public events, right? So going out into the community, meeting with people, talking about upcoming weather or different events is, is really key too. 
And so then also important to remember that these different groups are their own kind of sources for information. They're distilling this back down through. So the broadcasters obviously put it out on TV, but also are using social media to get that message out there, as well as emergency managers using their networks. And the public is also a source of information amongst each other, right? So sharing, kind of picking on the person that you know is never going to check the weather and make sure they know something bad's happening is something you heard a decent amount of. The ways that you can kind of, or creating a buzz about the weather. People are like, oh, I knew it was coming, because everyone on social media was freaking out. Um, so this is just a general map. And what I'm going to do is break this down by different phases of the event. So the first phase, looking at leading up to it, because the, the week ahead of time, the day of until it, the kind of the event starts in their county warning area, and then when it's happening, essentially. These are kind of the main phases. And I have a fourth phase, which is going to be afterwards, which I'll talk about at the end. And so what I did is I adapted that, that framework you just saw based on how people talked about their experiences and the information sources um, and which ones that they were mentioned. So first off, we have the phase one. So leading up to the, the day of the event, Sunday to Thursday before the Friday event. These are the key sources, right? So you have decision support service briefings, a little bit of social media being key there too. Um, and I have quotes that will contextualize each of these examples to say why they're important. And so from the broadcaster's perspective, they talk about how we reference these decision support service packets anytime there's a significant weather event. You know, they're really helpful to us. Like they're not going to just use them directly, they're also meteorologists, but increases our confidence and makes sure we're all on the same page and putting on a consistent message. This is also part of a really, like a, a network that works really well together. They don't have a very competitive media market, some places do, and they're trying to scoop each other and draw viewers to a different channel. Um, and this is a really, I think, a very congenial, like they work together well and they have a good relationship with the forecast office, which I think this shows, right? So they're really interested in putting out the co consistent message there. Um, and then you have from the forecast office, they're talking about how they had public events, which happened to be there because of it was Winter Weather Awareness Week, um, because this is a December event. And so we had talked about you know, working with school officials and having you talk there and making sure to plug it. Like, you all need to be watching Friday. Friday. Friday night's looking bad. So plugging it there, making sure people are aware. And they also had on Thursday, so the day before the event, they had a Facebook Live session. So they had a community meeting, similar platform kind of like this. Um, but it was also being streamed out on their Facebook page. And they talked about the Winter Weather Awareness Week, but then also spent at the end, you know, probably spent a good half hour, 45 minutes, answering the public's questions about the storm that was coming the next day. Right, so getting information out there, communicating ahead of time being really key. And so then as we transition to that next phase, so the day of the event, we see here still they have the day of packets they're sending out that are important. They do a briefing, letting people know what's happening are still key. And National Weather Service's chat is also key. Right, so an emergency manager points out that they really like NWS chat. You know, because for them, it brings all the information to one spot. And it's really interesting as a communication scholar because they're looking at different signals there. Like, do the broadcasters and the forecast office agree? And like, that was a signal, like, okay, they agree, so it's probably more confidence. And they also use it then to track. And I was like, okay, the emergency manager upstream of me just reported a tornado damage. I'm like, okay, I'm watching it. Right, so it's one spot to check it when you have a lot going on that you can follow this information through. But it also had problems because it wasn't working. It would go down and you're like, I need it to work. And so that was the frustration they had. Um, they're trying to work on it. Um, and then also an emergency manager here pointed out too that like, they'd done the webinar from the forecast office and they said, you know, hey, it's not looking good, major outbreak, getting people prepared for that day. But also um, points out that they only had 16 people die in their area. And they talk about it's amazing. Like, you know it's bad, but it should have been like four five times that. Um, because we had 30 minutes lead time. You don't normally have that, and we did. So that's not typical, and we had heightened awareness. So talk about like they were being ready, they're discussing in the media, weather service is discussing it, and we were already discussing internally. And I went to this community and I was talking to him, which is why he said you can see why. It is very devastated. Five months later, a lot of the infrastructure is gone. There's still people, you know, can trucks handing out meals, you know, kind of level of destruction to that town. And so just acknowledging two different points there, right? So that you knew five days in advance so you could talk about it as key, so that long lead time in that sense, but also the signal of it being on the ground, you had 30 minutes to react to it and led to a lot of positive outcomes through the different kind of communication sources. And then we have um, moving into right before, during the event. So this is when the trainers are on the ground here. You're not looking at these packets or briefings anymore really just on the go, issuing your warnings and keeping those products out there. National Weather Service chat goes down, and calls and texts become really important here. And so to highlight that, one of the emergency managers talks about, you know, I got a call at 845 from the lead forecaster at the National Weather Service in Paducah. And he says, hey, I'm calling to let you know it's going to be catastrophic. And, he's, <laughs> and he says, looks like it's going to stay south. And I have never heard anybody say catastrophic. And I was like, oof. OK. 
So I started calling the fire chiefs on the south end and said, y'all get ready. Right, so showing that knowing how to reach your people, because this is someone who's been an emergency manager for a year or two and has a lot of other commitments, is worried about their family, their communities, and how they're responding to it, and working through like a pretty limited budget. Right, so these kind of ways to reach your audience was really great in a lot of ways from the forecast office, and just kind of knowing that you need to do that. And another example of this interpersonal communication too, so you have another emergency manager, and just for context, this is someone who works like a quarter to half time as the emergency manager, is retired, and they don't have a full, like big operations emergency center like some other cities do, and it doesn't have a basement, so you have to go home and hunker down, and then you get to react after. Um, and so this emergency manager talks about how they got a phone call um, at 9.55, and it's the morning chief meteorologist at the office, and says, where are you at? And he said, I'm at my house. And she said, give me directions from the city. And I said, northwest of the city. And she goes, you're going to be fine. She said, hold on a minute, and it was 10 o'clock. And she said, in one minute, it's coming across this local landmark, but she told me exactly where it was going. And at 10, 10, nine minutes after it hit, our EOC was open because I had that personal communication. It's just really powerful examples of kind of knowing your community and what that did for them. And in that same, same vein, you also have people in the public starting to pick up the messaging that are putting out through the formal products here. Right, so this person I talked to, actually because of that other emergency manager, he was like, hey, you should talk to this guy, it'd be great. Um, and whether I liked it or not, the truck stopped and we got out of this person's house. <laughs> it was our first interview, we're rolling with it. And he's like, yeah, catastrophic tornado, I remember that. Which is five months later, I remembered the word. Um, and then I knew it was serious, and that really got my attention. Hey, hey, Chris, would you like to address this now or later? Sure, now, let's go for it. All right, could you share your thoughts on what role forecast visualizations play uh, in such communications? How effective are such visualizations in conveying the uncertainty in the forecast? There is, that's a loaded question. I think there's like, what, Julie, how many studies do you have in that same vein? Probably three, four, five right now. And I don't think there's an easy soundbite for that. I think that visuals are really important and communicating uncertainty is really important. It can be really powerful. I think in many ways, do we know how to do it perfectly? Not quite yet. Are we making advances? Totally. But I think that's something to like stay tuned for the RADS group and watch for some of the publications on the way out. And that's something that's probably gonna take more of a discussion than a quick answer. So if we can come back around to it and talk about it more, we can. But that's something that a lot of people in the research world and the National Weather Service are focusing right on. So you hit, hit it head on. So we can always come back to it. Um, and so we have this, um, the same person who's looking at the, like reacting to the term catastrophic. And you also know like watching some of these local cues, like I looked at it, you know, and it's coming out of that direction. That's normally where the weather comes from. And so just, I was concerned, just watch the radar, you know, chugging along. And so just showing that people are watching different things, like knowing their own environment is key, but also then watching radar and using these tools. And also from the public perspective, talking about the broadcast. So people really um, responded and talked a lot about the news coverage for that event. And so was one person talks about, you know, the news anchor told me, like, just said my neighborhood name. Like, hey, it's headed right for you. And I was like, oh, you know, goes to the husband, like, we gotta get to the bathroom. Like, this is coming for us. And they had a couple of minutes in the house later and was totally destroyed. You know, like the bathroom and the basement was pretty much the only thing left, right? But that personalization of the risk of information was like, they kind of were on edge, but that's like that last kind of point in the decision to, to take cover. And then they also had people point out that not many people have TVs, right? So you're not watching, or they have TVs, but you're not subscribing to local television the same way that you used to. And so most people watched on Facebook Live because the TV broadcast would all go onto social media and that's where people watched it from. And this person points out, you yeah, I knew we were gonna lose power. It can't be sitting in front of the TV. And you, there's nothing on anymore and you don't know what's happening. So we got on Facebook Live and we could also watch it from the closet, right? So we hunkered down and we could do it and we were watching it right through when it hit us. And so being safe, having access to information is really key. Also people pointed out there was a slight lag to it. So they're like, you have two minutes and it's like, you really have one. You know, thinking back through those really powerful stuff. And people also talked about the tone that the forecasters were using. It's like, I've never seen him so scared. You know, he just seemed so serious and it being really powerful. It's like, I knew that this was serious. He's not just getting hyped and excited. And so moving from there, um, the forecast office then lost power. So it goes totally offline. And so they essentially sitting metaphorically and literally in the dark is what one forecaster said, which I really like. And you're going full steam, issuing warnings, and it's gone. And then um, backup generator doesn't work. None of the efforts to bring this out, the system back online works. So they pass over um, essentially the, the forecasting operations to a different office. I think this forecaster puts it really well. So they say going offline is extremely frustrating. You know, it's probably one of the most frustrating nights. You can talk to you know, another, the, tech, the electronics guy who's here and he tried everything, and I mean everything. He called a tow truck company, 
they're trying to start the generator, their batteries out there, like the pouring rain, and there's lightning, and the face on his look on his face said it all. I mean, he was heartbroken. I felt the same way. I felt completely helpless. Right? So active tornado warning all the way through to nothing. And like talking about being a, wanting to help your community, and this is the way you usually help your community and not being able to do anything. Um, but then also I think this this quote really sums up the kind of the feel of that office. You know, it's just a really positive place and a really strong sense of community. Because he says, I knew that Springfield, the other office, had taken over the warnings when the power went out. And they did it. They were doing a fantastic job. And the way that they um, were able to pick up our baton like that and did what they did is nothing short of extraordinary. And it makes me really proud to work for this agency. Because people like that who can do that work for you. And so just dealing with that was really hard. So dealing with that loss and like that system in a really stressful day, but also then surveying hundreds of miles in short days because it's winter, um, and people wanting to know, like, was an EF5, you know, kind of needing that sense of closure, getting bombarded was also really challenging. And while there's still ongoing convection, too. So a really stressful time all around. And so coming back to those research questions, we see that the formal and informal communication pathways are crucial. But they're also varied in their importance at different times, right, and for different types of people. The strong relationships are key, so knowing then the community cohesion understanding, so knowing who your audiences are and how to meet them, also exceptionally important for communicating these events. And then how it connects to the, the physical environment, you can see because you have that strong signal with long lead times, both in terms of a couple days in advance, as well as with you know, it being on the ground for a while, being really key, so you have different time. And then the severity of the event also really lasts and has a lasting impact on people. And so just to highlight that too, I think we get really excited about the weather, right? So big systems are really like high level in intensity. But just remember that there are things that are hard for people, right? And they leave a long road of recovery and rebuilding, um, and especially challenging professionally. So we have a broadcaster here. Um, the aftermath of the storm, we were just emotionally drained after that. And the next morning, all you can think about is, did we do enough? What could we have done better to prevent any loss of life at all, right? So this is months later. It's still sitting on his consciousness, right? How you communicate this weather information really matters and really matters to these people. But from the forecaster perspective, they're talking about working during this event. So you see in the radar that this is capable of killing people. It's making a beeline for Mayfield. It's looking bad. It's a direct hit on downtown Mayfield. And this is what we do. You just have to do your job. Despite the fact that people are getting killed and whatnot, you just do your job. Get that message out there. I think it communicates a lot of the severity and intensity of some of these things. And we have to remember that this is an effect on people, too. right? So those big storms have a lot of those societal impacts in a lot of ways. And from the public perspective, too, they talk about how the, it kind of affected everyone. And you can see in the community there how they're responding to stuff when there was severe weather. But everyone's got PTSD now. Um, they're taking everything much more seriously. And then this is a wrapping up. Thank you for everyone that made that possible. Um, thanks to Julie for your excellent mentorship and asking me the question, is it ethical not to do this research a long time ago? And I try to say more on this, but I know I choke up, so I have to move on. But thanks to the Central Region and the people at the forecast office in Paducah that are really great and made this research possible. And the same thing, too, for MCubed, which also made this research possible, because I got denied funding to, from the early career travel funds. And then Nancy Sue kicked in as like, we can probably do this. And then they worked budget magic, and Gretchen approved it, and it was great. And I got to travel and do it. And so moving on to the synthesis and future directions, we've covered a lot of these topics and understanding that the weather system is really intense and has a lot of different considerations theoretically, but also the impacts of that system is really important and the outcomes that we see. So all the way from how we think about our AI and our numerical weather prediction models through to what it means for people's lives and their jobs. And for me, so I'm interested in these theoretical high impact research problems and I'm excited to continue doing this research in MCubed as a project scientist one. So continuing working in this AI space as well as um, helping with NCAR Convergent Science Initiative and then two, um, other things I'm interested in, if you're interested in writing proposals, not right now, but in a while, um, continue to work on <laughs> forecast information systems, the user-focused development, decision-making and use, and then communication environments, so for the weather-related hazards and more community international work. And so with that, I have time for questions, hopefully. Yes, I do. <laughs> Mocaster. Speaking of which, do you trust the Mocaster? No, don't, don't answer that. Don't answer that. But, but in terms of trustworthiness, it seems like in the, the, this particular tornado case, what made it 
work so well, it seemed like, there was an accepted authority that was issuing the warnings and so forth. Historically, there's been a lot of discussion about whether there should be competing authorities issuing mm -hmm. warnings and whether, whether the media can go off on their own and whatever. Yeah. Have you thought about um, the value of that single authority? Yeah, and I think, I think we see single authority, but I don't know that many people in the public would. You're right, so you think I have some coats out there, and like, I think the National Health Service was texting me. And you're like, probably wasn't. You know, maybe it was, but maybe not. But it was also then showed me the app where they got these notifications someone did, and it was the IBM app. Right, so I was getting my notifications from here and thought it was National Weather Service, right? So the idea of like, from us it's clear who the authority figures are. I don't think that most people, like myself included, before what, two and a half years ago, did not understand that, right? Because you don't need to most of your day. Your TV person can be a very big authority. And the way they do it, for a lot of people, that's your source. You know, and so I think understanding that our view of the system is kind of different than I think a lot of people who experience the system. And I think that for some people, the authority of the broadcaster was key. That was 100% important. It's like, I know you, and you never, you never overreact. And you're reacting really dramatically now, so this is my time. Right? Versus seeing the word catastrophic from the National Weather Service, and maybe not even knowing it was from the National Weather Service or not. Right? So I think that authority depends on who you are, right? so it's perceptual. I'm going to put different stock in different people. I could hate someone on one channel, but like the other person, because they're always more middle of the line. My dad does that. He's like, oh, channel 18 always hypes it up. But 13, they give it to you straight. Right? So I think knowing that we have authority isn't one blanket thing. Right? And there's a lot more contextual parts to it. Because it matters for who you are and what your authority figures are. Where you get a text from Julie being like, hey, your parents are in danger. I fast that along, like, oh, yeah, we were really bad. And I was like, because it matters because she studies weather. And Chris likes her. And so that's an authority figure. Right? So th it's a blended way. And that's a good shortcut. It worked out really well because Julie cares. Right? Right. Yeah, I, I guess um, the, the situation that would be discussed was, mm -hmm. OK, what if um, you know, the weather service is issuing a warning, but mm -hmm. somebody on the media is saying, no, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, that kind of potential conflict. Yeah, I think that, but again, who knows their audience well, right? So right. It, why are they saying not worry about it? Is it because it was in the southern part of the county and they're saying, if you're in the north, you probably don't have to worry about it? That's a different thing. <laughs> are they saying, I don't like the National Weather Service, so don't worry about it? I don't know that you'd probably see that, right? So I think it's like not taking those overgeneralizations because there's usually context to back it up, right? And so I think that you can't remove authority and take it because people are going to develop the way they want to, and then probably for their own good reasons. Right? And so the conflicts are going to arise for sure. Thanks for this talk. Um, I'm wondering, um, do you think there should be a further push for broadcasters and forecasters to kind of um, increase their, their, their output of, um, I guess, forecast literacy, uh, how to interpret uh, data such as just going through what what's going on on the radar, yeah. and especially in those situations where power's out, you can't actually receive information from your forecaster, but you could pull up radar scope. Totally, and so I think there's a couple of layers to that. So coming from science communication background and being researchers, we tend to always think that knowledge is the answer, right? Because that's our answer. That's why we're here, right? The pursuit of knowledge, generically, in some ways. And people have shown that it's called the knowledge deficit effect, right? So we think that we throw more knowledge and that will solve all our problems. And it doesn't usually work. You have like modest improvements in some of these ideas from knowledge. And there is good, like literacy always works. But the idea at the end of the day is that you can't be knowledgeable about everything, right? So I'm a, I'm a normal person sitting at home. It's like, I got to put food on the table. I got to do my taxes. I got to figure out what health care I need. I can't know all of those things perfectly. And every scientist wants everyone to know their thing perfectly. Well, you should understand the foundations of these vaccines. Like, I can't. Because you want me to understand the vaccines, you want me to understand the weather, you want me to do everything. It's like, I gotta work. Like, I, it's hard. You know, like the idea of like wanting more knowledge doesn't always work. So it's like, how do you work with that? The constraints of your system to get that message out there, right? And so, what are the key things you have to know? Who are the people you have to trust? Because you have to make some of these decisions and these leaps. We can't all know everything. So we'll probably have modest improvements in some ways, but also it's like, how do you reach people where they're at more effectively? How do you communicate the message in less time with a little bit, maybe it's a clearer visual of uncertainty in those types of points. So I think it's, it's part of the puzzle, but not gonna be everything. Because we can't all know everything, if that makes sense. So I think it's, you're there, it will work, but there's way more to it than that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, with the word trust being so squishy and um, personalized, <laughs> I guess, the way yeah. I would define that, I, I would think the, the biggest issue would be, you had a little time talking about like how you define it, but since everyone is, is 
determining what their answer to trust is is so personalized. How do you make advancements um, past that? So say, well, okay, we we want to improve, we want to get more trustworthy, but if the definition is so wildly different amongst people, how do you quantitatively improve that going forward? So the first success is the fact that you agree it's squishy and it's like context dependent and on the eye of the holder, I'm like, that's my whole goal. If you get that, if everyone thinks that, like we are in a great spot. Because a lot of people don't. They're like, no, I can tell you. Like you have to have these four boxes checked and it's trustworthy. Right, so if we, we break that down as a whole point of this paper, and like, hey, this is way more complicated, like that's a success to me, because then it opens up, you know, like I had that diagram of what are the words we care about, right? So is it reliance on information? Is it using it like effective use in these types of things? We can have more nuanced conversations that maybe we can define better, right? So what is limiting the conversation now from trust could be an opportunity for other ways if we realize it's not the best term, right? So I think in a lot of ways, I would probably move away from it in, in a lot, and again, Julie and I have talked about this. Is this the frame you'd pick for AI? Probably not. You know, I've studied a lot of science communication and trust has only been a little part of it. But it's an important dimension we have to work through now because that's the frame that's been set. And I think I 100% agree with you and I hope everyone does now that it is squishy and it's something we have to work on. I, I was going to say, what, do you want to get away from the word itself? But that seemed like uh, a non-starter. No, it's a great starter. I mean, I could talk about that for a long time. The idea is like in, it has a place, and it's an important concept to understand, but at the end of the day, there are a lot more other concepts, right? So you may not trust something, but if you're like, okay, it was a helpful tool to you, like that's a, that's a good outcome too. Or like the idea is you are skeptical of something, you don't use it, I like don't trust it at all. That's also a great goal if it, like, it's not the model that need, or the, the tool that fits your need. You know, so I think that maybe there are better parameters we can look for, for sure. Or just at least understanding the first point that trust is one piece of the puzzle right there. And it's not the end all be all dependent variable. Yes. Yeah. Um, I recently read an article about a tornado of roughly the same part of the country. And one of the problems that they encountered was that there were communities who had just moved into the area and they did not speak English fluently yet. And they didn't know how significant a tornado was, even though they heard the word. And did you run into any of this or do you have any comment on that? Yeah, so we hit it a couple different areas. So I think, I don't know if it's the same paper, but I think Joseph and America have a paper on that that I think might have just come out recently, looking at that. So looking at knowing a language barrier is key, right? So that's gonna be a fundamental problem for a lot of them. And it actually in Paducah, and a lot of other offices are issuing statements in Spanish. And there's also translation issues where like, how do you convey the intensity or use words that are gonna be regionally translated everywhere. And so there's great work coming from that group who are currently based at Oklahoma, I think. And, and so, that's one part of it, but there's also different dimensions to, like they say, the transplant effect, right? So there's a military base in the southern area, the county warning area. And I, one of the forecasters talked about how someone called and was like, I just moved here, I'm from California, we don't have tornadoes, I don't know what to do. I don't have a basement and I don't know anyone, right? So like, where should I go, what should I do? And it's like, okay, call churches, you can follow spaces, and like, what you need to do is find somewhere you feel safe and people you feel safe with. And so just like, and that was a conversation they had from the forecast office, because they didn't know what to do, like a one-on-one -on -one time. And then also another thing that they're working on doing is um, in that community there's a lot of Amish, right? So you don't get the messages the same way and they started doing call out alerts, right? So they call people because they do have certain access to landlines. So it's something they're thinking about for sure and how you reach those, but it's a definitely a challenge for sure. You hit on the right spot. I think I'll take the last question. All right. So, so uh, in the case study, how do you envision uh, using AI to, uh, you know, to improve it? In what case study for? The case that Paducah. So in Paducah, so there was one that we didn't look at that had nothing to do with AI. So I never asked them. So I looked at, and I have data on what types of tools they're using and what they found effective. Um, the case studies for AI tend to come more from the ai 2 project. So we've done interviews with forecasters for Severe Weather and Mariana Keynes has like presented on some of those before um, and digging into that space a little bit more. But as far as um, it applying to Paducah, I think that that wasn't a guidance limited event. Right, so they knew it was coming, they had pretty good information. They talk about like, and actually we interviewed a forecaster for both the AI project and this project, and he's like, actually the event that was way harder was the really weak signal, another different type of cool season event that happened the week before. Right, that was more challenging. You know, because I didn't really understand the signal that much, so I think hopefully they, you can have those advances and we can think about we're really putting the time into finding the forecast challenges, um, and not just like only focusing the big events, because I think no one was like, yeah, we had no idea what's coming. They knew pretty clearly what was coming. Yeah. Right? That makes sense. All right. Well, thanks again. And please huh. join us.